And we briefly started to touch on this, but uh, I guess a big one is thermal control. The space environment, not just as a vacuum, but has a very different thermal profile than on Earth. Yes, as we talked about earlier, space isn't really hot or cold. Yeah. Um, I mean, on Earth, if it's a hot day, you'll be hot. If it's a cold day, you'll be cold. That's right. Because you're interacting heavily with the environment. In space, it's not that simple exactly. because there isn't much environment. There's hundreds of kilometres of vacuum around you. It's like being in a really good thermos flask. Yeah. So what's happening is, if you're a spacecraft sitting out in space somewhere, you've got solar radiation coming in. Yep. That's going to be your major source of heat. That's right. You also get a bit of infrared radiation from the Earth if you're in a near-Earth orbit, which will heat you up a little bit, but not as much as the sun. That's right. But of course, if you're on the, on the night side, that might be the main thing. Yep. And all that heat's going in, it'll make you, if that was all that's going on, you'd get hotter and hotter and hotter as more and more sunlight and Earth-like came in. However, you're going to be radiating heat. That's right. You're going to be radiating infrared radiation out in all directions. Yep. And hopefully in equilibrium, the two things balance. Heat in balances the heat out. You can just stay at one temperature. Is that really the case, though? You also got to pick what temperature do you want. I yeah. believe you've got humans on board. You want it to be a human comfortable temperature. That's right. Actually, many uh, spacecraft aim for the same thing yep. because you're often using silicon chips or mechanisms that were built on the Earth's surface. That's right. And we know they work at roughly Earth's surface temperatures. Yeah. So if you've got a silicon processor, you, you want, want it to work it. like it is on Earth. That's right. Yeah. And if it were at a minus 100, it might well work differently or plus 300 or something exactly. like that. You could, in principle, develop new electronic components that were designed to work at minus 100 degrees. And in fact, that might yes. actually be better. You could have the whole thing with free superconductors. But that's a lot more expensive. It's much easier just to repurpose a chip that's been used something on the Earth's surface. And I get, it also goes back to that point we talked about earlier, is you have to know it works for other reasons, which means you have to test it. So these are all cost and mission design things that fold in. It's a lot easier to test something if you test it at room temperature. Yeah. So most spacecraft are designed to sit at about... Yeah room temperature, whatever that is, somewhere around that vicinity, maybe 20 degrees. So one thing you can do, of course, is to yeah. put reflective coating yep. on your spacecraft to keep the sunlight off, to stop yourself getting too hot. And you can see it on the uh, lunar lander here. And this is often, you see this in a lot of spacecraft, even in low Earth orbit or geosynchronous orbit, is this kind of gold foil that is used for that purpose. And you actually right. see the foil on the advisor yes. of the space suit, it's white, again, yep. to reflect the heat to stop, uh, this is Buzz Aldrin, I think, <laughs> overheating. Um, in fact, overheating is often a really serious problem for yeah. these things, especially if you've got a lot going on in your spacecraft, like a whole bunch of astronauts and mm. fuel cells and experiments going on. All that heat's building up inside and can't easily get out. I mean, my, my, my favorite example is if you've ever gone into a computer server room where you have huge racks of computers, it gets really hot in there because that's all just radiated heat from electronics, right? That's right. And on Earth, you can just have a fan to blow the hot air out, but that's not an option exactly, here. Exactly, that's right. So the Space Shuttle, for example, on the inside of its cargo bays, they have radiators and they, they will pump the heat from inside yep. uh, into a fluid and then it goes into the radiators to radiate out to space. This is one thing a lot of science fiction movies get wrong. They show the Space Shuttle flying around the space with its payload bay shut. Yeah. If you try to do that, it would overheat very rapidly. Exactly, it was always essentially open. That's right. So it has to be open to radiate the heat away. And the International Space Station, we talked about the solar panels, but these things yes, over here right. are heat radiators. And again, what happens is there's a, a, a loop of fluid that will carry the heat from inside out to these things where it's radiated out into space. There's yep. a fair bit of area, not pointing towards the sun ideally, to radiate that heat out to space. And so that will keep you cool. Yep. And so it's a careful design. You don't want to do active cooling if you can avoid it. Yep. So most spacecraft, they will try and design it just using reflective coatings or radiators passively, so it'll just automatically equilibrate at the right temperature. Yep. But for things with humans on board are particularly often in active systems, which is more that can go wrong and That's more right. expense. So you don't exactly. want this. Um, what you normally do is you design spacecraft so that when they're working as normal, yep. with people inside and electronics working, they'd stay at a comfortable temperature. But if something goes wrong, so this is Apollo 13, where they lost yeah. most of their power. So I guess if they lost most of their power, they lost most of their heat sources inside, right? Now you could have designed a spacecraft so it would stay at a comfortable temperature without the heat sources, but they designed it to stay at a comfortable temperature with all the things that would normally be operating Because there. that was kind of sensible, because they should always be operating. So when all the stuff stopped working, the temperature would be radiating more out to yes. space than was being generated or picked up from the sun, and it got very cold inside. So, it got, so and I think this is always a, that misconception, right? We think it always got cold because there was no heat on. In fact, the problem was the heat sources weren't generating, and so the natural design made it cooler. Yes, it's not because space is cold. Exactly. Space doesn't really have a defined temperature. It was designed so that it would hold its temperature with power inside. When the power inside went away, it cooled down. 
luckily not enough to kill them. And this can be used yes. to good purpose. So this is the James Webb Space Telescope. And what you actually want is the telescope side of things to be extremely cold because it's trying to look at infrared wavelengths to see the very faint infrared light from the other end of the universe. And it can't do that if it's hot itself because exactly. it would be glowing at these wavelengths. So you need to have the entire instrument with all those electronics ultra cool. Ultra cool. And you want the, ideally the entire dish to be cold exactly. as well. Now, in previous missions, what they've done is they've basically yeah. put the telescope inside a large flask of like liquid helium. Yeah. And that keeps it cold for a while until that boils off. Yep. And that's what gives the, the limiting lifespan. Yeah. But here they decided to use passive cooling. So yes. what you've got is a multi-layer sunscreen. So down the bottom, you've got the solar cells, the electronics, yep. and this will all sit at about room temperature because yep. it's easy to design. And then you've got this multi-layer, which keeps the radiation away. But this side is still radiating out into space. Yeah. So this bit gets down to about, I think, 50 Kelvin or thereabouts. Exactly. And minus 170 all, degrees. And, and again, by having passive cooling, that means it's less things that can go wrong, but it's also not limiting, in this case, the lifetime necessarily due to the heating. So it's not going to run out of coolant at some point. It can That's stay right. cool forever. Which is unlike things like the Hubble Space Telescope, which actually does need a little bit of coolant. That's right. Um, another problem, though, is that as you, you're going to go in and out of the Earth's shadow, we already yes. talked about in terms of Earth's um, power for your cells, you need batteries, but also it means everything will get cold because yes. if it's designed to hold its temperature when there's sunlight coming in, when there's no take the sun away, it'll cool down. And this is a big problem for the Hubble Space yes. Telescope early on because it would be plunging into the Earth's shadow for 30 minutes out of every 90. That's right. And when it went in, it started cooling down. It turned out the original solar panels went twang uh, and bounced and vibrated a bit. And so, and then when it came out into the sun, it's heated up and twang. And I guess a telescope that's supposed to be stationary, if it's uh, shaking a little bit, isn't that helpful. So you've got to design it so it can cope with the change in temperature from night to day, as well as the average temperature. And I guess that's the benefit of James Webb, right? Because of its orbit, it's not actually going actively through the Earth's shadow every time. Yes, but most satellites are in an Earth orbit, yes. so this is a problem.